This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Russia has launched a major offensive to seize the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine with Ukrainian officials, saying Russia is attacking its positions along a 300-mile front line. This is Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky speaking on Monday. We can now say that Russian forces have started the battle of the Donbass, for which they have long prepared. A very large part of the Russian army is now focused on this offensive. The Russian defense ministry says missile and artillery forces struck over 1,200 targets overnight across Ukraine. In the western city of Lviv, seven civilians died and 12 were injured Monday after Russian missile strikes hit the city where thousands of displaced Ukrainians are living after fleeing, fighting in other parts of the country. One missile strike shattered windows of a hotel housing evacuees. Russia has maintained its attacks are targeting military installations, including command posts and weapons storage depots. In other developments, the United Nations says the official civilian death toll from the war has surpassed 2,000, but Ukrainian officials say it's far higher. In the besieged eastern city of Mariupol, Ukrainian forces are continuing to reject an ultimatum from Russia to lay down their arms. While Russia seized most of the port city, Ukrainian forces and civilians remain holed up in a massive steel plant. Earlier today, a commander with Ukraine's far-right Azov regiment accused Russia of dropping bunker-busting bombs on the steel plant. Earlier today, Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu criticized the United States and its allies for funneling arms to Ukraine. He said this, quote, clearly demonstrates their intentions to provoke the Kiev regime to fight to the last Ukrainian standing, unquote. This comes as Reuters reports the Pentagon's planning to start training Ukrainians on how to use howitzer artillery systems. Last week, the Biden administration announced plans to send an additional $800 million in arms to Ukraine, including Humvees, coastal defense drones and howitzers. To talk more about the war in Ukraine, we're joined outside of Kiev by Peter Zamayev, director of the Eurasia Democracy Initiative. Uh, Peter Zamayev, welcome back to Democracy Now! Um, in the U.S. media, uh, you have—it's a redefinition of general news, right? News from the generals on all of the military tactics. But we want to talk to you about diplomacy. What do you think is a possible path to peace at this point? Do you think there is one? At this point, I don't think so. The Russians are really between a rock and a hard place, um, you, know, you know, in this new offensive, because the sacred day of May 9th is coming up in the calendar. That is the day of the, the victory of the Soviet Union over the Nazi Germany. That's the day when the military parade takes place in Moscow. And Vladimir Putin is going to have to show some uh, some victories for all the blood and treasure that he's expended in Ukraine. So his generals are following orders, do or die, and uh, give him some victory. That could be the capture, the final capture of Mariupol. Uh, obviously, a formality, sim simply because there's no no more city standing there. Essentially, all of it will have to be uh, essentially, you know, uh, uh, knocked down because no, very few buildings remain livable. But if they could build up some sort of a Potomkin village there, which the Russians are very adept at doing, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, put together some military parade down the main drag of Mariupol uh, to show to the viewers at home, that would be something that could be construed as, a, I guess, a, a temporary limited victory. But once again, make no mistake, Vladimir Putin, whatever his intentions are in Donbass, if he's able to achieve some victories there or not, uh, and if at that point there will be talk of a, let's say, a ceasefire, I'm, I very much doubt there'll be like full peace talks, but maybe a ceasefire. He will not stop at that point. Uh, his goal, I think, remains uh, controlling all of Ukraine, or at least uh, you know making it a failed state, getting rid of the current uh, government. 
Uh, and Peter, you mentioned uh, the situation in Mariupol. Uh, the, uh, there's not only a significant force still left there, a few thousand of the Azov Battalion, but the New York Times is also reporting that there are about 800 foreign fighters that are in the city as well. Do you mm. think that that's going to have any impact on the ultimate uh, 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 the ultimate tactics of the Russian military in trying to stamp out the remaining opposition? Well, I, I, uh, I, I'm not sure we can corroborate that that number. I mean, it seems to be uh, to me a, a bit high and exaggerated. But there probably are uh, foreign fighters similar to what we saw in you know in the Spanish War in 1936. Uh, Ukraine has obviously garnered a lot of worldwide sympathy as the underdog in this fight, and so there have been a lot of interest to come and fight uh, for Ukraine. The efficacy of that is questionable. Obviously, you know, not all are able fighters. But when it comes to Russia's Response: Nothing will stop Vladimir Putin. You know, there already there were already uncorroborated reports, as you, I'm sure you have heard, that uh, limited chemical weapons were used in Mariupol. I cannot confirm or deny that, but you know, the Russians already are using very very heavy bombs, uh, striking that steel plant where the remaining you know defenses hold up, along with 2,000, mind you. 2,000 civilians just in that steel plant. So uh, they are willing to obl obliterate the, the steel plant, the whole town, and declare it a victory. It's a, a, truly a scorched earth, uh, you know, tactics. And in terms of the uh, the change in uh, strategy of the Russians, of uh, obviously from first trying to encircle the capital to now concentrating on the east and the the and the south of uh, of Ukraine, uh, is it your sense that there's still a, a, a hope of uh, Putin to be able to uh, conquer all of Ukraine, uh, given the fact that there's really not sufficient number of Russian troops to be able to do anything in near near that? Well, that's a very good question. You know, it's been, uh, you know, uh, kind of a, a sight to behold from the beginning of the campaign. Uh, American generals and uh, military experts and European experts and uh, experts the world over have sort of asked this, uh, themselves this question, like, how do you expect uh, to achieve any military goals when you go in into a country of 44 million people hoping to, uh, you know, invade and control it with uh, fewer than 200,000 troops. You know, it took 500,000 uh, Warsaw Pact troops in 1968 to invade and control Czechoslovakia to put down the revolt there. And the size of Czechoslovakia and the weapons it, it had at that point, there's no comparison with Ukraine. So it just uh, brings to mind this line from uh, Thomas Friedman of the New York Times that was just reading his op-ed. I think it says it all. He says, high coercion authoritarian systems are low information systems, which means that, you know, Putin has been drip-fed this information that he wanted to hear. And he grossly uh, overestimated, A, uh, the readiness uh, and the capability of his military, the state of his uh, weapon systems, and uh, B, he underestimated Ukrainians' willingness to fight. But what you're saying, uh, Juan, just to come back to, uh, you know, uh, the battles we're seeing now in the East and obviously the continuing, you know, battles in the South are part of Vladimir Putin's original plan to try to cut off Ukraine from access to all seas, to Azov Sea and the Black Sea, and maybe allowing uh, for the creation of some sort of a rump Ukrainian state that would be uh, essentially landlocked. Peter Zamayev, let me ask you about the whole world reaction to what's taking place. We definitely know about the U.S. and Europe. And, of course, you're the director of the Eurasia Democracy Initiative. Thirty countries have sanctioned Russia. It's mainly the United States and Russia. Um, mm. They represent 15 percent of the world's population. Ninety-four countries voted to throw Russia off the U.N. Human Rights Council. Um, they represent 24 percent, a quarter of the world's population. Um, the developing world has a different reaction to this, saying, this is not our war. What do you say to them? And how do you think um, this can be resolved and bring China into this picture? Well, I think you, 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 you hit the nail on its head when you mentioned China. It's uh, it, uh, the sheer size of India and China, which are so, so somewhat sitting on the fence, China less so. China is uh, at least officially 
a you know as uh, an ally of Vladimir Putin. India has all like old uh, Soviet era uh, you know ties with the Soviet Union and now Russia as the successor state. So it has uh, a, a mixture of uh, pragmatic military interests and economic interests and some nostalgia as well. But if you take these two countries and their combined population of two billion people, this is how you arrive at those at the numbers that you quoted: twenty four percent. Uh, of the world body, those who uh, voted to kick Russia uh, off the, the council. So it's a little bit misleading because we're only talking about two players, but they have obviously they're, they're humongous in size. Uh, they, you know, China, I think, is having some second thoughts from the very beginning of this. They just haven't been able to say it like that simply because they signed a, a pact with Putin and it would, you know, damage their reputation to just be seen walking away from the ally. But I think they're having second thoughts uh, about like this new world order that Russia w was so eager to proclaim with their uh, attempt at blitzkrieg in Ukraine. Uh, it, it half, I think, expecting China to follow up and invade Taiwan. All of a sudden, China is having second thoughts. It's not gone according to plan. India is having second thoughts uh, as well, but they're still buying Russian oil at a steep discount. The, both countries need to understand that this is leading to disasters that will be knocking at every country's door. Already, as you know, we're facing uh, a famine throughout the develop developing world, including Lebanon, Libya, and Yemen, because the two countries combined, Russia and Ukraine, produce a bulk of the world's uh, grains. So uh, no one is going to be, be uh, benefit it, specifically China and India, which are so globally uh, inter interlinked, so globally involved that, uh, you know, for them to be really uh, aiding Russia at this point and helping Russia means ostracism economically, because some of these sanctions uh, that have been slapped on Russia will be affecting them as well. So while the governments there, at least officially, are neutral or supportive in words of Russia, or at least sympathetic, businesses in China and India increasingly uh, agitate to, uh, to be a bit more reasonable and to, uh, to try to, um, you know, bring, uh, to try to use their country's might uh, to, uh, to strive for peace between the two countries. Uh, finally, back to Juan's question at the beginning, you have this war in eastern Ukraine now. That's where Putin is focusing. But then you have the bombing of Lviv all the way in the west, where so many refugees from the east have fled to. Um, the significance of that hit. Mm -hmm. The significance is, is very clear. It's tit for tat. As you uh, probably mentioned in your program, uh, the sinking of the Moskva, the Moscow cruiser, was a huge blow to Russia's uh, prestige and to Vladimir Putin's pre personal prestige. That cruiser was supposed to be—was uh, was said to be his favorite. Uh, and this so, is the flagship uh, uh, warship. The flagship, the flagship warship, uh, the first such sinking in— uh, several decades in uh, you know of recent history, uh, and so Vladimir Putin is really uh, you know venting his anger uh, on Ukraine. Uh, coupled with that, I would just mention there was a re recent article in a state-run uh, media uh, publication, which essentially. Uh, said that Ukraine must be de-Ukrainianized. The whole country was declared Nazis. So we're seeing a very Hitlerist kind of uh, Hitlerian uh, strategy being played out. Vladimir Putin is taking it very, very seriously. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, President Biden has said it, uh, it was very clear in his assessment that this smacks of a genocidal policy. It's now very personal for Vladimir Putin. And if anyone needed any evidence that this was a one crazy, obsessed man's war. I mean, this is it. He's striking on Lviv, the most Ukrainian city, the, the city that's uh, as removed from Russia as, as anything, the city that was least Russianized. And he's also sending a message that nowhere, no matter where you are in Ukraine, you're not going to be safe.